All right, here we go. Overdrive, off and running. TSN 1050 on the TSN app, your home smart speaker, and up on TSN 4. Brian Hayes, the O-Dog, Jeff O'Neill, Jamie Noodles, McLennan. How we feeling on a beautiful Monday here? Hall of Fame night here in Toronto. It's going to be a good one. I'm been fired better. up. Love the Hall been, of Fame. Love the Hall. Better. Been, been better. better. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What been better. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Not good. Not a good AZB. start. Like I told Luke a couple weeks ago about the Chargers versus the Jets. Okay, I just want you to listen to me for a brief moment. I just threw a little nugget out there to let it marinate into his system and let him go do the right thing. It's called guidance. It's like guiding you in a certain direction. Yesterday, we had a conversation. Mm -hmm. No, it was actually... A couple days ago. A couple days ago. A couple days ago. O-Dog, need a pick for the uh, survivor pool. Yeah. And our options were Buffalo mm-hmm. or Cincy. Yeah. And I said one thing to you, and it was a nugget that was supposed to go into your brain and marinate and, and <laughs> sprinkle knowledge. And I said, I'm worried about Cincy as having a letdown game, but ultimately it's your call because you're the boss of the survivor. And what did you do? Went with the Bengals. Yeah, we went with the Bengals and we're out. We've been grinding through 10 weeks. I've never been more furious in my and life Hazy, watching that game. I, Hazy, I don't know what it is about the survivor pool. It like It's the same feeling as losing to Detroit in the finals when I'm out. It's because it's like this little side thing on the weekends where it's like you nod the head, you're like, alive, on mm-hmm. to the next one. I know. It's like Bill Belichick, survivor pool, on to the next one. And then I saw the Cincy score, and I'm like, we're done. Like, I don't have that extra little nugget on the weekend. I know. And it bothers it me. It bothers me. I'm sick to my stomach. And, and listen, Boyd, like, it was, was in his hand, third down. <laughs> like, I'm watching the game. This is where I have too many things going on with gambling. I, I need to start focusing because the Packers are playing the Steelers. My brother-in-law, Trevor, is a big Steeler fan. He sends me a note. He's like, should we bet on the game? I'm like, sure, I'll take the pack. You need but, a whiteboard. Yes, I do. To track everything. So he's on the Steelers. I'm on the Packers. I got that. In our in our Hazen company versus Timo and Wilson, I'm on the Ravens against the Browns. That's tight. <laughs> right. I lost that. The Packers <laughs> lost. And yet, the only thing I'm watching is Bengals. I'm like, they have to. To win here. That's your survivor. That's our survivor, and we're alive. And and it has been a landmine the whole season in the NFL. There's barely any teams left. We're one of the last, like, hundred. You guys had survived. We had survived landmines through nine weeks. And I'm watching this. They're down the whole game. They're down 10 with, like, four minutes to go. Burrow's throwing picks like he's (laughs) Mac Jones. And I'm like, this is sickening. As soon as I say he's back and better than ever, he absolutely jams us up. Awful. I'm going to hate his guts for at least 10 days. Like, I just, how could you do that? Houston, I don't care about their quarterback, the young up-and-coming quarterback. You screwed us, Burrow. Yeah. And I take it personally. Well, he and, and Tyler Boyd, who, like, the ball was in his hands that would have made it a four-point game. That means C.J. Stroud in Houston would have had to go down the field and actually scored right. a touchdown as opposed to just a field goal. But, hey, and maybe my little nuggets, I'll just keep them to myself and and, and go on FanDuel and yeah. do some of my own damage because I threw one out to Luke, ignored, screwed. Yeah. Threw one out to you, ignored, screwed. It's like... I know. I got to admit, I so blew you, right through the stop you sign. Took, he, he, he wanted the to... Bills tonight. He wanted to take the Bills. So I'm not, listen, the Bills have not no, been no, the Hazy, team of consistency. You're, you're, I did not say I wanted the Bills. Right, that my, was the I, indication. My, I only said, since he scares me with a letdown. And that was what it was. Right. That's what and it was. it was a letdown game against Houston. That's man. right. It was a letdown wow. game. Now, you got to give credit where credit's due. Houston is a great story right now. Right. CJ Stroud might be the he's probably in the clubhouse as a as the MVP leader right now in the NFL. As Could a rookie, be. what he's doing with that team, the stats he's putting up, it, it's incredible how well he's playing. And even like in the the game's tied, there's like a minute 20 on the clock. They have one timeout and this is how much faith I have in him already. I was like he's driving down the field. They're going to win this game. And that's exactly what happened. And D'Amico Ryan's has been great as their coach down in Houston. That that franchise has been in shambles. For years, you know what Strauss got in his around. corner. His teammates are going on TV after and saying, "We're glad we got this guy on right. our side." 
as opposed to a team like New England, you never hear one guy say anything about well, the Well, the, o- the, the, the owner and the coach and the GM hate his guts. They cannot stand Mac Jones. Like I, to, to bench a guy with a two-minute drill is almost unheard of. Like the idea that it was a two-minute drill and they're like, Bailey Zappi, you're up. And Zappi goes out and just... Dude, I don't know how much I can watch of that cat either. Bailey Zappi. Doing the fake spike into a bad pick. It was so embarrassing. It was so embarrassing. <laughs> the fake spike into a pick. Like it that's was... honestly, that's a flag football play. Like you think you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're buddies. You're like, watch this. I'll fake spike it and then yeah. throw it. There like, is dude, overweight the guys that are hung over playing football <laughs> yeah. on a park that are doing those moves. Right. Yeah. Like that's that's a that's a that's a frisbee like golf. Is that play. like is that a <laughs> but the look on Belichick's face, I was saying this disgusting. to you off air. Like he is disgusted. Disgusted. And old Bobby Kraft is on Bobby, his way to Florida right yeah, now. I wonder what Bobby was up to in Just, Germany. He probably went right did to Florida. Did you guys Florida. see Bobby Kraft in the box? I don't know if anyone else caught this, but there was somebody sitting Beside him, that I reckon, I thought I wrecked. Did you guys see that? No, I didn't see that. I didn't see old Bobby. No, I I thought it was Matt Lauer uh, (laughs) sitting with Bobby Kraft. I don't know, man. I Matt Lauer, like the NBC dude, used to be. I don't know. I got run out of town with the button. Yes, Matt Lauer. Yeah, he was the what was it? Good Morning America or whatever. JP, please try to get some viz of Bobby Kraft because I'm I'm almost positive I saw that. You thought that was Matt Lauer next to him? Okay, I. I don't know, man. I don't even really son, want to find out. No, that's his son, man. That's his, oh, that's, sorry, so that's son. Stephen Kraft. That is not Matt Lauer. That is that's his kid, Stephen Kraft. I believe is his name. He does kind of look Stephen, like Stephen. Uh, Stephen. Yeah. Apologies. I am sorry, dude. Yeah. Apo- look at the Gore-Tex on Bobby. Like, is he serious right now? But do, can you guys understand where I got that? Yeah, he does bit. look yeah, like him. He, he actually like does. does. There's like... no way Matt Lauer was invited to the. Dude, that's box. why I was confused. I'm okay. like, Bobby Kraft. Like, why are you hanging with that cat? That's right. bad PR. Yes, that. Is, no, that's his. That's his kid. That's that's the younger Kraft. Stephen Kraft who. Also hates Mac Jones. Yeah, I'm Steve, sure. I'll bet you Matt Lauer is not a big fan. Sincerest either. apologies, bud. Yes, yeah. you look apologies. like Matt Lauer a little bit. All um, good. Okay, so we we got a we got a big one today because Luke is coming up. Luke Wilson will join us later this afternoon. Dan Patrick's coming up. We got nice. a lot of things to get into with DP on what we've seen out of the NFL. We get the Monday Nighter down the road in Buffalo. Bills Broncos tonight. You guys will have that pick, so we'll get to it. Ryan Rashog later in the hour as well. You know we focus so much on Edmonton, and we will talk a lot about the Oilers and. What happened over the weekend, and they're in action tonight. But the Leafs, I think their wheels up like right now. I think I was Going surprised. To Sweden, right? Yeah, I think Ottawa's already over there. I think they're already over there. Doesn't and the Leafs Ottawa, who plays today. first though. Who plays first? I thought Ottawa plays the first game there. That's okay. why. I, I thought I Ottawa plays the Thursday. The Thursday. Okay, that would yeah. make sense because the Leafs play on the Friday. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, Ottawa plays Thursday. Detroit. Yeah. The Leafs play Detroit. Friday. Yes. So Detroit plays back to back. Back to back. Then I guess they're out they of there. They must turf off. Yeah. And then Senators play the Wild Saturday. And the Leafs play the Wild on Sunday. Is so it? So the Leafs get both teams back to back. I guess so. That sets up pretty well. That's, that was probably the agreement. Like such, if we're going over so there, greasy, like that's so <laughs> funny how they. Oh, we'll get you on the back to back, and it's road games for them too. Uh, of course it is. They're not. You think the Leafs are wasting two yeah. tickets at home? Like this is the politics of the NHL. We're, right. Every team kind of has to do something for the league. This is for the betterment of the brand and the shield and go over there. But you know the Leafs are like, let's clarify something right now. We are not giving up a home gate. Right. And, and we, we want, want preferential te- yeah, treatment. Yeah, we want the teams on their back-to-back. <laughs> right. So, and that's basically what like, happened. Okay, we'll do that. Well, yeah, that's I fine. was talking about this with somebody this morning. What is it benefiting? Like, there's never going to be a t- – it's not like the NFL, which everyone kind of thinks in the future there could be a team in Europe mm-hmm. or two – what is the sense of going to Europe to play these games? I, for me, why I'm, the hell the are way. they in Australia in in the preseason? Like that one makes on no the, sense, dude. Like, if Australia? I'm on the team, I'm like, it's 82 games, and you really want? You think I need to go to Sweden? They're gonna get jammed up getting there, feeling like garbage for a couple of days, and it'll take them two weeks to figure it out when they get back. I'm telling you, it's just stupid. Yeah, I, I no disrespect to anyone in Sweden. But why the hell NHL teams are playing games over there is nonsense. I, I hated it too. There's a couple different reasons why. For me, like our show, the way that we watch the NHL and everything, 
it's every second day for me, you know, watching the Leafs, watching the Oilers, watching Vancouver, all these teams that are playing, right? Ottawa, obviously. Like, when they go overseas, the Leafs play two games in, like, the next 10, 12 days, right? right? So that takes everything out of the mojo. Plus, they're going to be now your standings watching because other teams are catching up or passing in games and all that. Then you, you start to factor in, okay, does that trip help or hurt them? Time change, jet lag, all of that. Like, these teams that go over... I know you're trying to grow the game, but I just, I've always disliked that. Again, it's above my pay grade. I don't really care, but I care more from a selfish viewing standpoint. Yeah, too. it feels like to me, it's, you know, there's only so many pure hockey countries in the world that they can attack, right? right? Like it's, and Sweden happens to be one of them, right? Mm -hmm. We know that Sweden, Finland, big time, yeah. Russia, they're not going to, obviously. Yeah. But, this is almost them throwing a bone to all the Swedish players that have played here. I'm sure they they I'm sure there's data behind the support they get over there. I don't know. Are jersey sales high over there? Do they do is there some sort of TV deal? I don't I don't have the answers on that. But right. you know, they're it, they're you're trying to go international, you're trying to capture as many markets as you possibly can. And as a result, you know, the four teams that go over, they got to go over and bite the bullet. And it's been happening year I, in, year I, out, and it will continue to I'm happen. I'm shocked that the Leafs are part of it because yeah. they're usually tied into more, you know, national TV, all of that type I would of Saturday guess, nights, all yeah. of that, right? And I, I would listen, the, the Leafs have a long history, though, with Swedish players and with Sweden. Like Boreas Salming and Matt Sundin, to, to my knowledge, are the two most revered Swedish players ever, and they were both Maple Leafs. And right. long-term Leafs and like legends and gods in that country. Yeah, and, and you I, throw in Forsberg and Lundqvist. Like they're just, I mean, well, there's a they, lot of great Swedish for, players, yeah. but like Salming was the first, and he yeah. was over here, and it was the Maple Leafs and and Sundin. Like you played with him when, like in 0, 06, I believe Mats was the captain of that team. Like it, it was right. as much as Lundqvist was there and Alfredson and the Sedins. Like right. there's been great, great Swedish players. Sundin went first overall, first Swedish player ever, I believe, to do that. Anyway, it doesn't. No, but my point right. being is, I think the Leafs have an appreciation. I think I'm sure the wheels were in motion anyway. But you know, Salming last year passing away, the news True. of Boria. Um, I'm sure the Leafs were like, okay, we'll go over there. We have a rich history there. But yet, you're right. Usually, it is four teams from smaller markets. It's like you yeah, got to go like over there. But the then at the same time, you look at the NFL, and the NFL is as big as it gets. They just sent Kansas City over there. Yeah. Right, Kansas City and Miami went over there. The Bills went over there. Yes, Kelsey's got some air miles on him, hey? Kelsey's got some Argentina? air miles. He's in Argentina <laughs> taking in Taylor Swift concerts in, in Buenos Aires. Let me okay. Like, how long of a I, flight is that? I'm completely off the rails here. I and I believe me, I cannot speak to fashion. But what the hell does he wear? His gear is the worst gear in, in uh, the league right a, now. Dude, it's the, the worst, worst gear in the I, league. I don't know I what he's doing. I would be so afraid of Taylor Swift looking at me saying, what the hell are you wearing with these blue jean outfits and <laughs> but this it's, nonsense? He had like an eight ball on his shirt. That's what I mean. It was like, ice. like a, I've seen this. Like vanilla, vanilla Ice used to wear that. That's right. Ice Ice Baby. That was the outfit with the giant pants. Yeah, that's exactly what like, he was wearing. It looked like spray. You know, you, you spray paint like stuff onto the back of a of a coat. It's brutal gear. Like again, I have it no leg to stand on because I do gear. not dress impeccably. But that watching him stand there and she sings that song and includes him. Karma. Yeah, yeah. karma or He's whatever. All jacked up. And he's standing there in like a a, a shirt that's probably a twelve hundred dollar shirt, but it looks Probably weird. more than that. Yeah, exactly. But Anyways, yeah. I'm off the rails. No, but you're right, though. I, I think the same thing, like him walking around. There it is. <laughs> like he's got like leaves on it. It's a Tommy Bahama shirt. Yeah. It's just brutal gear. There's but, no other way to describe it. But maybe it. that's the way. That is the way people dress today. You know, No one's old dressing man. like Travis Kelsey. We man. are old men. Yes, I don't know. Are. But it is just uh, watching that. And he walked. Remember when they were walking out of the stadium together and he was wearing like a a jean suedo like he was literally yeah, that's right. wearing like that was when she first went to the game yeah and, yeah 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 in the like through the locker room and yeah, all that his and outfits are outrageous bad gear man luke's talked about it bad it's gear. shocking the leash this guy has superstar not on the team like he's been at the world series he's been all he was in philly watching mm -hmm. baseball and now he's in where <laughs> he's like in Buenos, Buenos Aires, Aries, which, watching Taylor Swift. Uh, JP just said from New York. That's an eleven-hour flight. Now it's PJ. Of for course sure. it is, but still, he just you mentioned he was in Europe, back right. Buenos Aires, back. 
Yeah. And they're probably looking at it saying, hey, man, like, have you seen who else Mahomes is throwing to? Like, we need you to have some legs down the stretch here. Yeah. Like, you, you, if it's Super Bowl or bust, Kelsey's going to factor in large on that. Big time. And, uh, but I'm with you, man. I'm glad you said it because I've been, I, I have no style. Like, I'll be the uh, first yeah. to admit, this is a great example. This shirt, I forgot I had this shirt and I found it today. I'm like, I'll rock that shirt. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll, I'll wear that shirt. I found it in my closet. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'll bring it out. I found I money right probably there. Probably had this shirt for years. I'm <laughs> right, like, yeah, yeah, it's not a bad looking shirt. I'll yeah. sneak that in. I don't, I don't have a leg to stand on. No. It's just, I, I'm like, okay, is that what the kids are wearing these days? Like, I'm looking at that. I'm like, that, that, that is something else. There's like else. clovers on it. And I've seen it. Like he's had ones with like, like pool, like, like a cue ball yeah, on there. a shirt. Like, and this yeah, I'm sorry. That's just, that's not good gear. But anyway, Travis Kelsey's living his life and he is obviously living a pretty good one yeah, at good that. Yeah, good him. Um, but yeah, the Leafs are, they're on their way to Sweden. And, and, you know, they had, those were two big wins over the weekend because of yeah. the, the mood on the way over the media on the way out, if you lose those games, all of a sudden you're really chasing it and you're in a bad spot. And like, oh, you were down there. Oh, Noodles, you were down there on yep. Friday. And it was, um, you know, it was it was a typical early season Leaf game. But the one on Saturday, I was there. That one sticks out to me. Like the game against Vancouver, I thought they played great in the second and third period. Like they dominated. That's off a of back-to-back when Vancouver was waiting for them. The first period, they were chasing the game. Because they're on the kill the whole uh, whole period, yeah. But that was because what is what is clearly happened here is they're overcompensating for the Boston embarrassment, right? Like they're overcompensating. They when the Marchand Lilligren thing happened, they had their meeting, and now they're like the rest of the league's looking at us, the rest of the league's laughing at us, and we're not going to put up with it. And I have a great appreciation for it. Like that Giordano fight was a great tilt, and yeah. Gio won that fight. Like that's yeah. he's forty years old. And, you know, he's got pride. He wants to be a part of a team that obviously is not being laughed at. And that's a, that's a reaction. Domi had a reaction later in the game on Cole when he threw a big hit on Robertson, which I think there's a connection there because obviously he's trying to take Robertson under his wing a little yeah. bit. Um, and I think that's a perfect example of how you can have your cake and eat it too, where, yes, you took instigators, and the league's got to give instigators there because you can't have fights after clean hits without some sort either. of a penalty. And was it a clean hit? Because Sheldon Keefe said, did you uh, hear his comments thought, today on the camp hit? Yeah, I it looked, I mean, I was in the building, so they I didn't see. They were clean hits. They I looked like so great too, hits. But did you hear Sheldon's yeah, comments today? Yeah, kind of tongue-in-cheek like, that he's. After, like, the swelling's coming down after that massive clean, clean hit, hit to the head. Camp. I was like, it was. Yeah. Like, it was a hard hit. And I... I like the response, and I like the overcorrection. It shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have to come down that way. But better late than never. You're pushing, which, and it's still early in the season. Yeah. What you're doing is saying, okay, maybe we we didn't handle it properly in Boston, but we're not. That's not going to be the case moving right. forward. Right. And, and I was not, fine. With I that. don't want to make it into a massive ordeal. And it's great what Geo did, and it's great what Max did. But if they're ever really going to have the viewpoints of their team and their personnel change from outside people, which maybe they don't even care down the line. It's got to be John Tavares doing that, or it's got to be Austin Matthews or the two of them or Matthews and Marner. And then people might look at it and say, maybe they've got it now. And maybe they are different. Like I, I'm not going to get into, I'm not going to go full Toronto on this and make this into that. It has to be them, but for it to actually someone look at it and say, those guys are different. That's what has to yeah, happen. No, and I'm question. Not ta- no question. And it's, I'm not taking away from what those guys did, but for people to really look at it and say, it is different, which down the line is for someone else to figure. I have a pretty good idea. I already know, but down the line, someone else will have to figure it out if they change and are different. If it makes a difference in in, in what happens to these guys' futures, right. yeah. Because at some point, something spontaneous is going to happen when they're on the ice. That's right. right. Like it's and if be... they're just looking around saying, "Oh my God, who's going to punch that guy in the head?" It's going to mm-hmm. be like, well, yeah. well, and there I'll, you go. I think the example is the line made. With Matthews now, where you look at Robertson. Now, Domi may have reacted that way if Yarncroke got hit, if anyone got hit, but I'm not sure. I, I think in particular, he's like, this is a young guy. He's coming up. He's on my wing. I'm the veteran. I, I want to protect him. Where if Nyes gets hit like that, that's what we're talking about. At some point, it's going to be Matthews who says, no, that's my guy. Right. He's on my line. He's a rookie. And, you know, yeah. there's going to have to be a reaction. But, again, it's it's a bit of an overcompensation, but it's one where... 
I didn't love the fact that they didn't kill either penalty. Like those are ones where you guys know, like some kills are more important than others. That's one Absolutely. where you want to get well, every, a kill. You galvanize because you're like you want. You to. take that instigator, you'll take we'll it. We'll kill it off, and let's kill it but off. They didn't suck it up. They yeah. didn't kill it either of them. I believe Vancouver scored on both, yeah. but still, they got the win in the end. So you serve the message, and you got a win in the end. Right, and hopefully Sheldon Keefe was right when talking about Domi, when talking about Bertuzzi, when talking about Klingberg. It's going to take some time. He said this early in the season, a couple of games, and it's going to take time for everyone to find their role and to get comfortable. And as of right now, it looks like Bertuzzi's looking more comfortable on that line with John Tavares and William Nylander. Yep. Pretty hard not to, the way that those guys are playing. Yeah. But the, the, that seems to be going well. Max Domi playing with Yarn Croak. And Robertson, maybe that's a quality third line that contributes some offense. It's got some bite. You saw the fight with Max Domi. But the big question is, that fourth line chips in some goals, and they don't get scored on four times. And guess who's not on the ice? Right. is Ryan Reeves. So how they're going to approach that, I guess going into Sweden and after that, is going to be interesting. Because, it, Hayes, you were in the building. It had a different look as opposed to getting caved in and, and pulling pucks out mm -hmm. of your net. And I feel for the guy because he wanted to come here. He seems like a great guy. He's a team guy. He's old school. He plays hard. But when he's on the ice, it's not working for them. So how they're going to handle that is going to be very but interesting. Isn't it like it should have been accepted right from the start of the year that he wasn't probably going to play every day? He's 37. Like we didn't – the only difference that for me – is the guy who's 40 is playing every night because they can't. Like, they don't have anybody else, really. And that's Gio. Like, right. The older guys on the roster. And he shouldn't even be playing every night, Jamie. But he should be he like. He has to right now. He should be a quasi yeah. in the state of his career and his age and how good he's been. He should be helping. He should be coming in and out of the lineup and helping young guys. But they are, they have no one else. They so have to play, play him. Every, they have they to have play, him, to play right him. And I, I have a great appreciation for his approach. I think since the Boston game. But I thought on Friday against Calgary, Giordano was really chippy, edgy. And on Saturday, that's exactly how we played. And what I, I appreciate is that's a guy who's 40, who, who is hearing what's going on and yeah. understands that there's a depth chart, and he doesn't want to take himself out of it. And it would be easy for him to say, I'm making 800 grand. I've played 1,000 games. I've won a Norris, whatever. The fact that he is still almost acting like you would expect a 20-year-old to act. In other words, I got to stay on the team. Like, I, I'll fight if I have to. I'll hit if I have to. I'm going to be pissed. I'm going to yeah. block shots. Like, that is really Im Comes impressive. Comes every night. It was really He's impressive. A great leader. He, he is. Really is. And, I, I, like, you really witnessed that. I saw it again. Lot. Not that I'm not familiar with his game, but I thought of that. I'm like, all right, he looks at this like, okay, Lilligren will return at some point. Timmons will return. All of a sudden, Zadorov wants to come here. Where do I fit? Yeah. And what Giordano was saying to me, based on his actions, is I'm not coming out. Go talk to someone else. Like, I'll, I'll hit, I'll fight, I'll block shots. That doesn't mean he'll stay in the lineup. And I agree with what O's saying, that at some point it should be, he should be your sixth or seventh defenseman. But he's not going to make it easy. No. And a lot of guys we've seen on this team and other teams in the league make it easy. Because yeah. they're like, nah, whatever. Oh, I got paid. I've got my guarantees. I'm going to mail it in. And he's not going to do that. He and I, and that should have a real ripple effect on the rest of that room. I agree. He's a great leader, but he gives you everything he's got every night. And that's, he doesn't cheat you for effort. And you know what? Seeing him, like, that looked like a resurgence this weekend. Like, because there was a couple games early on the season where you're like, yeah. Not but, good. Like everybody else. But I, I loved his Friday, Saturday game. That's Mark Giordano vintage. vintage. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was a fun night, though. Saturday, like a couple of fights, big goals, and, you know, a couple of wins that were needed, and they got them. So now you're off to Sweden, you play a couple of games over there, and all of a sudden you're 8-5-2, five, and two, and you're in a better spot than it you could have been if you found a way to, you know, lose a game against Calgary or throw away a game against Vancouver. Did you say hi to Joe Lynn? I did. Yes, I did. I saw I saw our... One of our favorites. Joe Lynn was down there. I knocked on the door. She let me in. A little stop and chat. I saw Tyler. I saw Cassie down there. Popped into the alumni box. The I'm best. like, did you stick your nose in, like, get some food, too? No, I didn't. We no. went in. I was down there with my wife. We went in. We saw We saw Tox. Tox was down. Gary Lehman was down there. Gary came over and love said Gary. hi. Said he loves noodles yeah, as a teammate. Gary, no, yeah. in the show. And a bunch of, bunch of guys down there that we saw. And the penne <laughs> pesto comes up, and I made the comment. I'm like, I... 
I'm perceived as high maintenance. In the, I'm not even an alumni. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, like, Hayes, we making, don't have penne pesto. Yeah. Is that they said? They're like, oh, sorry, no penne pesto. I'm like, do you guys realize I didn't play for... I'm so lucky to be in here. <laughs> like, I have a high-maintenance reputation in the alumni box, and I'm not yeah. an alumni. I love but, it. But uh, it was awesome, though. It was a really cool night. And, like, the Remembrance Day stuff, the Hall of Fame ceremony on Friday. It was a really cool weekend down at yeah. uh, Scotiabank Arena. Really cool. Again, the Leafs are uh, off to Sweden. They're in action again on Friday. Raptors in action tonight. Monday night or tonight, we'll tee that up. But our buddy Ryan Rashog is a busy man. Shogger is a busy man these days. He's taking requests left, right, and center, and including from our show. And we're going to head out to Edmonton and get his take on what happened over the weekend. Jay Woodcroft is out. Chris Knobloch is in. Paul Coffey is in on the bench. The Oilers are in town and in action tonight, obviously playing the Islanders. So... What's the vibe like out there? Where does McDavid fit in all of this and his future? There's a lot to get into on the Oilers front. So we'll catch up with Ryan Rashog. We'll do that next. Overdrive continues, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. We got Chris Johnston coming up. There he is, Ryan Rashog, right into it. How great is that? I did, we didn't even bring him in. He's just on the screen. Yeah, all of a sudden, he's there. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> hey, Ryan, how are you? Oh, the audio is not can't working yet. Okay, so we got visual, but not audio. Yeah, visual. You let us audio. know when we can figure that out. That out. Okay. That's what that's threw, what me, threw off. me off. Like, usually, usually we bring him in, in, in and Rashad's just standing there. Yeah. But uh, anyway, let us know when we get the audio. Obviously, we know why we're having Ryan on. Not that we wouldn't have him on any other day. We're always happy to have Rashad on. But Jay Woodcroft fired over the weekend, and Chris Knobloch is hired, and Knobloch is not a guy that I would expect many people are familiar with because, you know, he's a junior coach for quite some time, and he's been in the American League, uh, American Hockey League for a while. Hartford, he's the AHL coach for the Rangers. For the Rangers. And, and he's assistant coach in the NHL, I think, for a couple of years with Philly. Philly, I think Philly, it was. Philly, yeah. Yes, yeah. but again, not a household name. Nope. But has a history with McDavid, has a history with, I guess, Connor Brown, with uh, Warren Fogle, with Jeff Jackson, who now runs the show out there in Edmonton. So and is that why this guy got hired, Hayes? Because that, he had a relationship with McDavid? That's what it screams of to me, oh, but uh, obviously Christ. Jeff Jackson knows him. Like, you know, Jeff is, was an agent that was in Toronto and was working in Ontario a lot. I get and, it, and I appreciate thinking outside the box, just not recycling and grabbing some guy just because he's been in the, L, mm -hmm. in the NHL before. But I don't know. Let's ask Ryan about it. He'll okay. More details. There he is, Ryan Rashog. You can go ahead and answer that, Ryan, because that's what it screams of outside Edmonton is this is McDavid's guy, so that's why he's the head coach now. Yeah, and I think there's a few decisions that have been made that kind of lead to that narrative, right, about like you know, just with Jeff Jackson being brought in the position he was brought in, and now, now you know, Chris Knobloch, and Connor Brown, his old line mate, kind of is like, you know, like Jay Onright flat out asked me last night, what's going on? Like, is he the GM or what? <laughs> I did a bit of tweeting on this front today, guys. Mm -hmm. I got some clarification today. I had, a, I had a conversation with Jeff Jackson. Bottom line, Connor McDavid is not consulted on these big organizational decisions because he doesn't want to be. He's not brought into the process. He's not consulted. He's not in the room to make the decision. He wants to focus on hockey. So the idea that he's behind the scenes like hey bring this guy in bring that guy in it, it's just not accurate it's not what he wants he doesn't want that level of involvement and jeff jackson would know that he's been along for the ride with Connor mcdavid this entire time what this speaks of is an organization who looking to the future is obviously really worried about potentially losing Connor mcdavid one day for sure they are why wouldn't they be and so it's very clear they're making some decisions with that in mind putting some people in place that he's comfortable with, people that he's familiar with, trying to set up a situation where McDavid is, is comfortable. And I don't think he's asking for that. I think they're doing that. And these are good hockey people. It's not like these are crazy hires or anything, but you can't deny the pattern. It's very much there. Rish, where, where did Woodcroft go wrong? Because... I can go through a laundry list of things that the Edmonton Oilers personnel-wise have done. Thinking that their goaltending was even close to being good enough in this league is complete insanity in my mind. And there's some other signings that could have led to maybe different goaltenders and different personnel. But as far as Woodcroft himself, is like this changing the defensive system a week before the season, is that what did it? Because, I don't know, what what else led to this firing other than the record? 
You make some really fair points. Oh, like there's accountability at the management level for sure with Ken Holland. No question. He's the one that did that Campbell deal. He's the one that left him tight to the cap, right? So that I they couldn't, couldn't have Why didn't he just players. call me, Ryan? He could have just called me, I swear. Well, I know. And, and uh, fair enough, right? The, de- the decision was the decision. But to Woodcroft, was it fair? Of course it's not fair. It's a coach getting fired on a team of, you know, 20 plus guys who aren't performing properly. So, no. It, Professional sports is not ever fair, and and this is definitely one of those cases. If you want me to make the case for what Woodcroft did to put himself in this position, here it is. He took a team that, from the trade deadline in, defensively wasn't that bad. Fourth, fewest goals against per game after the trade deadline. Now, that changed in the playoffs. They were more porous. But he made the decision that they needed to play different defensively, so he implemented some new systems to try and improve their ability to defend. And it was a disaster. It was a disaster. The numbers are horrendous, right? Their goals against, their inner slot shots, protecting the middle of the ice. So the optic is there that he tinkered with it and broke it. And then it gets to be situation critical in the standings. And then on top of that, and oh, I'll put this right back at you. Do you think a head coach can stand there and every day of the season talk about how it's not the system, it's too many individual mistakes? At a certain point... Fixing those mistakes is the coach's job too. That was his job to figure out how to get the players to stop making those individual mistakes because he talked about them for a month. And that's but Ryan, if I'm in the locker room, if I'm in the locker room and he had anything to say to me, I would like I had a bit of an attitude problem later in my career where I said some <laughs> things. I would but say, why don't say. you get a goal t- <laughs> trail of the lines? No, no. A loose I cannon, say, it's been described. Yeah, but I would say, why don't you oh, get a goaltender back on, there? It's not all on the goaltending, though. They were giving up 25 high-quality chances noodles, a night. But you just don't it's have a, a chance la- to win. It's, it's like a lazy it's, narrative to just go, ah, oh, it's all the goalies. Guess what? Stuart Skinner played in the All-Star game last year. He I'm hasn't not been, talking they're about both, last year. They've been terrible. Right. I, I, I'm not, what I'm saying is that that was one of their problems. They had 10 problems. Mm. It's not just the goalies. It's the fact that... They, that Darnell Nurse and Cody Ceci and Evan Bouchard and and you go right down the list. Forgot how to play hockey for a month, flat out. Yeah. Right. A- am I and wrong? Part right? of the issue, guys. No, you're not. Part of the issue is when the barn is burning, you got to come with buckets of water, right? If you're Jay Woodcroft, right. you got to show up with a bucket full of solutions. What are you doing different? What are you trying different? What methods are you using to fix some of these mistakes? Get more accountability from your players. Oh, a coach needs to be able to hold guys accountable without having to put up with, you know, whatever might be coming. You have to. You cannot talk about individual mistakes killing your season for weeks on end and be the guy in charge of making sure they stop. So accountability was a big issue here. Well, with Ryan Rashad, here's where I have an issue with the idea that that's going to change is the perception, everything you said about McDavid and, and your reporting on this, that he was not involved, he doesn't want to be involved. That That is separate from what I believe from the outside is the owner being terrified that he might leave or that Dry Settle might leave. 100%. So if, if from the top the mentality is we need to make this guy happy, then how is Chris Knobloch going to keep Connor McDavid accountable? We can talk about Nurse. We can talk about Nugent Hopkins. You can talk about right. the goalies. I don't believe for a second Chris Knobloch is going to go in there and yell and scream at Connor McDavid when he knows the owner is terrified that might piss him off and McDavid might leave. So how do you marry the two? How do you yeah. keep players accountable where you, when you, the organization is basically operating under the premise that guy is Teflon. That 97 is different hell, from everyone else. Hell of a needle to try and thread, right? Takes a deft touch. Mm-hmm. I would suggest a rookie doing it for the first time. Despite the history with Connor McDavid, it, it's going to be a tough needle for Chris Knobloch to thread. Bottom line, you'll make Connor McDavid and Leon Draisaitl happiest if you're winning and if you're getting results. And if you need buy-in from those players, if you need to have a conversation with those players and say, look, accountability is an issue, so I'm letting you know right from the outset. Right? You talk to those guys and you say, this is what I'm going to do to try and hold this group more accountable, but it's going to have to apply to you guys too. So if you're on board, fair warning, it has to be across the board because I believe that's what is going to get this group to take the steps it needs to take. What are they going to say, right? It's it's a difficult thing to do because bottom line, McDavid and Dreisaitl need to lead the way. They need to lead the way with their effort level, with their habits, 
their attention to detail, their body language, the way they react when bad things happen. These guys are the entire temperature of this team. They need to be leaders on all those fronts, and they haven't been so far. They have room to adjust these things in their game, and if the coach wants some accountability, they're going to have to buy into that too. There's just no choice if that's what the formula is. Do you believe, Ryan... And, and this isn't anything about the hire. This is just the overarching take a look at this. Do you believe there will be a response? Because here's what I would see. In my mind, I thought if they're bringing somebody in, it's got to be old school heavy. It's the Laviolettes. It's the Sutters. It's people like that. The no-nonsense. You can bring them in for a year because they know how to win. They know what to do. Bringing in a guy that, yes, Connor McDavid knows, but just to your point... Leon Dreisaitl doesn't have a history with, and the guy's 45 years old and never really, I mean, he played the game, but not. You know what I mean? Is he going to be treated like the substitute teacher? That's the thing, because in essence, was Woodcroft treated like the substitute teacher at some point too? The the game is different nowadays, and it's a question to you, Ryan. That's not not a statement. I'm just saying the game is different nowadays where – Guys do look back there, and there has to be a level of respect of what, who they're working for, who they're working with. How is Knobloch going to establish that immediately outside of the parameters that you just laid down, the, You know, saying to those guys, I'm holding you yeah. accountable as well as everybody else? And that's part of the issue with this, is they've started in a deficit on that front with this hire. Right, Jay Woodcroft had you know 17 years working his way through the National Hockey League. He had coached these guys in his, as an assistant. There was pre-existing relationships with all the main players. He comes in as the head guy, got amazing results right away, and he had buy-in. McDavid and Drysaddle today both said no chance he lost the room. Guys, my gut feeling, and I just came from that locker room, my gut feeling in talking to those two players, I think they were stunned that this happened. I really do. I think that they were feeling like they were hopeful they were turning things around with that win. And when they got that news, and I don't believe they knew ahead of time, that they were stunned. And, I, and, I, and in some ways, I think probably a little bit angry. And, and so, but angry at themselves and holding themselves accountable. So now they've got a coach that hasn't done this before. And they're kind of starting over again. And it's going to be a tough hill to climb. But... We know how talented these guys are. We know that if McDavid and Drysaddle sort their games out right away here and they get any goaltending at all, they're going to get back on track, guys. It's not like it's some crazy algebra equation that they got to figure out how to write this thing. It's pretty, pretty right there for all of us to see, isn't it? Well, that's what is kind of amazing when you look at the opportunities that Knobloch's predecessors had. Like, you got a situation here where you're Chris Knobloch. Regardless of how you got the job, why you got the job, you're there. You have McDavid and Drysaddle in their primes. Um, and like Woodcroft did, like Tippett did. Like, this is the fifth coach now in McDavid's career, which is remarkable. Nugent Hopkins, I think, is up to like eight. It's like the it's like the Browns quarterback 10. list. It might be ten. It's wild how many coaches I think he's they've played gone for through. almost half of the coaches in Oiler history. I thought I saw that on Twitter the other day. That's amazing. That blew my like, mind. No one even brings that up. Nuge is just like, sorry, who are you? You're the new coach? Okay, great. Yeah. Just tell me where I'm supposed to stand here. But That's insane. It's crazy, and there's no stability there. And now, yet, again, if you're Knobloch, and I guess Paul Coffey, and we can get to that in a moment, but... We've what an opportunity. We've got to get to the owner. Well, the too. owner's at the, at the uh, of course. Like, that's always the reputation, Ryan. You could speak to it. Like, we're in Toronto, clearly. But the reputation outside of Edmonton is that Cates is just, you know, yes, he's an owner, but he's a super fan, and the 80s Oilers have been running it forever. And I guess that's kind of continued because, for some reason, Paul Coffey's on the bench, and no one can really explain why he's on the bench. Yeah. So... There's a relationship there between Daryl Cates and Paul Coffey. There's a friendship there um, that's developed. Paul Coffey, he's not just kind of being parachuted in out of nowhere. He's been around. So he's been around the organization uh, a reasonable amount. He's been working with different players individually. Like he, he, he has been around, but you make a very fair point, right? How can a guy have the job of advisor to the owner and also be the assistant coach sitting in the coach's office. How do you maintain a normal chain of command? How do you maintain, like how is Chris Knobloch put in position when the players look at the situation? Even I mean, anybody that looks at this situation is like, 
who's in charge here? Like, what's, what's happening here? You got a direct pipeline to the owner from the end of the bench, which Paul Coffey's really well-intentioned, and I think he, his plan is to help this situation. And I think, you know, I asked him the question about that. He said, well, it's about respecting everybody. I think he's really well-intentioned here, guys, but this is odd. Like, there's no denying this is an odd structure for Paul Coffey, basically on a temporary basis, right? He's here mm -hmm. till the end of the season in that role. And holding on to his role as, a, as advisor to the owner as well, it's got, it's got to be one or the other. Or the chain of command just gets mucky. And that's part of the issue. You want to talk about empowering a head coach? They didn't let him bring in his own guy. They handed him a guy who, by the way, is on speed dial with the owner. The optics are just, it's, it's definitely it's off, strange. Guys. Yeah, it's strange. It's uh, it's been a strange start, and now they got the Islanders in town tonight. Which the Islanders are just going to play the same way they play every night. Sorokin, I believe, is starting, which is terrifying because he's so good. <laughs> he is, and um, something's going to have to give. So we'll see. It'll be an interesting night. It might uh, work. Yes, it, it might, might work. Like well, who that's knows? what I was going to say, Paul, Paul Coffee. Yeah. Who, hey? If he's been watching these D men do the same things over and over again, and just simply say that right there or whatever the hell they were trying to do in their own zone, if he can fix that alone, then it's a victory. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that right there. He has presence. <laughs> he has knowledge. You know, this guy, I mean, this might work. I don't know. But we can all agree heading in, it's a little odd. A little odd. A little bit strange. A little bit different. All right, Ryan. <laughs> great stuff, buddy. Enjoy the game tonight. We'll do it again soon. All right. Yeah. Cheers, guys. There he is, Ryan Rashog. Good uh... Out in Edmonton, and of course, the Got Your Back podcast with yeah. our boy Struddy, who I'm sure is on fire these days. And I, I can't even imagine what Rashog and Struddy, and like if this kind of goes south and doesn't work like afterwards. Well, there's nothing like, you can do about it now. Like, that, this is, you're not having, this is, this is the thing that, wrong wording, pisses me off about all this. Jay Woodcroft has had 100 wins in the last year, yeah. two seasons, or when, since he's taken over. All of a sudden, he's forgotten how to coach 12 games in. How about the players play better? Well, and, and there's... Flat out. The, the wild thing is, you know, naturally, the, the general public's going to go to the best players. And the assumption is, okay, it's McDavid, Dry Settle, they're the greatest. But they haven't been. And I know McDavid's banged up. I think we all can see that. But I saw someone tweeted out last night. He has... He's gone eight games without a goal which ties the second longest goal streak of his career. He has one point in his last five games. That is the fewest points in a five-game span in his career. Yeah. Like, he is doing nothing offensively. And Dreisaitl's not far behind him or ahead of him, I guess. So, yeah. yes, you can. there's so many different fires out there. But what it makes looks, this fascinating it, it, is how great these players are. They're in their primes, and, and it's they're, being completely they're in wasted. A slump. They've got to play. They've got to play better. They like, have it's, to. It's more than a slump. It's got, like, a different look to it. It's yes. like... They've always been too good for that to happen. So it honestly, I always look at it and I'm like, it looks like there's something wrong there, like seriously wrong. Somebody did something or I don't know how to explain it, but something, sometimes something internally goes on where you see a team play and you're like, they got issues and I don't know. I've never seen those guys play like that. It's those awful, guys are yeah. automatic, two off games, and they light it up the next one. That's what's shocking. Both of them are gamers. Like both, right. like McDavid's the best player in the world, and that hasn't changed because of thirteen. Yeah, the other or guy's games. second. Exactly. That's and the other guy I think is even more clutch in terms of like it's a moment. Watch it. Like right. watch yeah. yourself. Dry Settle's coming tonight, and he's I haven't done it. Yeah, it hasn't games. happened. It's wild. And what is Dry Settle? He has fifteen points, and I think McDavid has like ten. Yeah. Like they're like getting, it's it's not even close. Yeah. It is not even close to what like, the expectations. It are. It is a top player league. I say this all the time. Like you. You can't expect Warren Fogel to dig them out. Not it happen. has to be McDavid and Drysaddle. Yeah. That's who they pay. Yep. So. Uh, Chris Johnston in about 20 minutes. Dan Patrick coming up this afternoon as well. Luke Wilson still to come too. Overdrive continues, TSN 1050 and on the TSN app. All right. Chris Johnston coming up. Dan Patrick coming up. Monday Nighter Bills in action. Great cup has been set. The Argos. Didn't go so well. Ooh, was that a choke job, man? It wasn't even a choke. It was just Dude. a they didn't even show up. They got pumped. They got Boston Bruined. Like yeah. they, they they were clear away favorites and they just pissed it away. But they beat themselves. Chad like, Kelly. It, That's it, one of the worst themselves. performances. Like yeah. I felt for Kelly after the game, but he's a pro athlete. You know, he's had he had a great year. I think he'll be the MOP. Gave him a contract. He's the guy. Threw four picks and lost a fumble. 
Like it's, I, I was listening, I was watching the game, and then I got, well, I was going down for dinner and going to the Leaf game. I was listening on the way down, and Mike Hogan, every other sentence was <laughs> pecked, Poor intercepted. Ho- somebody should check on Hogan. Hogie, I think, was in a dark place <laughs> on Saturday. Because it was, Poor Hogie. It was that ugly, and yeah. like pick sixes, like it was just like they are not well, winning the pick this game. sixes were devastating. Yeah. Like, devast- like it's not like, Montre- did Montreal play great or the Argos I, played awful? I think like, Chad Kelly played awful. I, I, yeah. there, there's something that position. There's some positions you would know this. Yeah. You lived it. A goalie, a quarterback, you can literally lose pitcher. the game. Yeah, a pitcher if you're throwing matzo balls or over. That'll the plate. eat at those guys. That'll eat at those guys down the road, man. Because oh. it's a wasted opportunity. You look at the Boston Bruins last year. Mm-hmm. The Argos, like it's just like yep. it, right. it doesn't kill you. You live your life and go on. But you sit down at a campfire when you're 50, 60. I do it now at 47, where you're like. That was just such a wasted opportunity. Like, it could have been so different, man. Yeah. Like, the, the outcomes and different lives, things that happen to people yep. could be so different if you just won that You one. win that game, you win the Great Cup, you're considered maybe the greatest team of all time. That's right. And now, you're at all these functions. Yeah. You're, it's it's and now life-changing. You're, it's completely forgotten. Way. Like, let's That's call right. it what it is. No one's going to remember the Bruins. Nothing. And even the Warriors, I mentioned, when the Warriors won 73 games, they lost to LeBron in the final. Yep. Yep. That was the sure. finals, game seven, but they lost. Yeah, but now it's like the Argos, okay, great regular season, but you got pumped in the East final. Wasn't good. Wasn't good. All right, Chris Johnston coming up. Dan Patrick coming up. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 4.